uh, uh, chapter 33. These are the journeys of the children of Israel who went out of the land of Egypt by their armies under the hand of Moses and Aaron. And now Moses wrote down the starting points of their journeys at the command of the Lord. And these are their journeys according to their starting points. So what Moses does is he wrote down a complete log of all of the cities that they had uh, gone to from the time that they left Egypt through the 40 years of their wandering to the time that they were now in position on the plains of Moab to enter in to the, to the promised land. Now, some uh, critics, and there's always critics of the Bible, and then they look and say, well, how in the world could Moses be, have written the Pentateuch? You know, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. I mean, he's just a shepherd and all these kinds of things. And pro- how could he didn't know how to write and all. He was raised in Egypt. He was raised to be the next pharaoh in Egypt. And here we have even the record here where he was keeping a log of, of all these things. At least we're told the cities here uh, uh, on, on things. And so this is what uh, he was uh, uh, taking and making a record of. And then at the beginning in verse 3, he starts to lay out the different cities that they went to. Now, this is a historical record that he gives here. And historical chapters in the Bible are important because they make us realize we understand this is God's word. We understand that it's supernatural. We understand that it has uh, type and imagery that's involved in it. In, in addition to the obvious plain meaning of the words and different things. But it's also a history book. And so this this just reaffirms in people these events happened. This was a part of human history with the children of, of Israel. The other thing that it does as he lists all of these different cities, uh, it is a reminder to the children of Israel and a reminder to us that he knew about every single stop they made during the 40 years of their wandering. He didn't miss a single city that they stopped in. You ever have a place in your, your, your Christian life and you say, God, do you even know where I am? Yeah, I, I do. I do. I can write the city down for you right now. And he, he, know, he knew exactly where they were every step of the way. Now, the interesting thing about these cities, and uh, you may say it's very hard to make something interesting about these cities, but there is something, a couple of things very interesting about them. And one is, is a lot of the cities, we don't know where they're located today. It's impossible. They were cities that were in existence in those days, but they've been long lost to the sands of the uh, Judean wilderness and Sinai Peninsula and all that area down uh, down there. And, and so they're, they're long gone. But a lot of the cities continue to uh, are identifiable today. But it's impossible to sit on the base of these cities and determine an exact line of their journeys during the, the wilderness wandering. He lists 42 cities here and uh, why he lists the cities that he does. Probably it, the, these were the cities that God remember we talk about um, we talk about the children of Israel wandering in the wilderness and so we sometimes have in our mind that as God is waiting for that that generation to die out in the wilderness that they just get up in the morning put their sandals on and they head out for another day of just wandering in the wilderness you have to be careful of that because uh, they were being led through the wilderness by a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And probably these cities are listings of cities where the pillar uh, of, of God stopped at a particular place and had them stay for at least enough time that they had to set up the tabernacle and the whole system of worship and then take it back down in order to leave. So he mentions they departed from uh, Ramses, uh, in the first month, on the 15th day of the first month, on the day after the Passover. Remember that Passover that was a part of uh, being uh, uh, the, the judgment of the final plague upon uh, Egypt, the, the death of the firstborn, that first Passover that took place in Egypt. Uh, the children of Israel went out after that Passover with boldness in the sight of the Egyptians. For the Egyptians were burying all their firstborn, whom the Lord had killed among them. Also, on their gods, the Lord had executed judgments. And so this city is uh, probably a city that was in the kind of delta region of 
um, uh, of Egypt, and it was their departure point uh, out, of, uh, out of Egypt. That was the place that they left uh, following that Passover. And then the children uh, of Israel moved from uh, Ramses and uh, camped at Sokoth. And they departed from Sokoth and they camped at uh, Etham, which is on the edge of the wilderness, they moved from Etham and turned back to Pi He Hiroth, which is east of Baal Zephon, and they uh, camped near Migdal. And they departed from before uh, Ha He Roth and passed through the midst of the sea into the wilderness and went three days' journey uh, in the wilderness of Etham. And so here we have a record of the crossing of the Red Sea. And you notice they passed through the midst of the sea. They didn't wade knee deep through a marsh of the Reed Sea. So here we have a record of God knows what city they left when they crossed the, the Red Sea, what city they went into immediately following that. And they camped, we're told, at the end of verse uh, 8 at Mara. And you remember that's where they went and the water was bitter there. And uh, so God instructed Moses to throw a the tree, not a tree, the tree that he had pointed out into the water and sweetened the water and they were able to uh, have fresh water to drink. And they moved from Mara and they came to uh, Elim and at Elim were 12 springs of water and 70 palm trees. And so they camped there. Now out in that wilderness, we've got uh, 12 springs of water and 70 palm trees. Let's not leave here. I mean, that's a pretty good uh, place. And all that's recorded for us in Exodus chapter 15. And they moved from there and they camped by the Red Sea. And they moved from the Red Sea and they camped in the wilderness of sin. Now, is there anything, any greater? Um, it's, just a, a, it's just a territory. And in a, uh, a larger territory, but sin is a wilderness. It's just so aptly named, the wilderness of, of sin. So that was where, in the wilderness of sin, that God began to supply for them with manna. And so manna began to fall each day for them to eat. And they journeyed from the wilderness of sin, and they camped at uh, Dovka, and they departed from Dovka and camped at Alush. And they moved from Elush and camped at uh, Rephidim. And uh, Rephidim is where the Lord provided water out of the rock for the very first time as Moses smote the rock and the, and the water uh, came forward. So an interesting thing about that, uh, one of the interesting things is here they come to this place and there's no water. Moses, there's no water and we're dying of thirst and everything. So Moses, he smites the rock under God's instruction and the water comes forth and they were uh, get blessed with all of that water. And, and you look and, and here and they're in Rephidim and they could be looking and say, we left uh, Elim, for this, we had uh, all of these 12 springs of water and 70 palm trees, and he takes us out of here to Rephidim. I mean, what is God thinking here? What, how, how could he take us from one thing that's worse, uh, you know, very, very good into something that is obviously physically worse? So they're stretched, and they're upset about and all uptight about everything. The thing of it is, is that if you stay in Elim, where the springs are, and where all of the palm trees are, and God never moves us away from that, then we will never experience water from a rock. So if you and I want to experience the miraculous in our Christian lives and see God do what is humanly impossible as he leads us, it means that he's going to have to put us in humanly impossible situations. So I have a choice. I, 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 I'm, either, I'm either going to experience verse 9 here and not know anything supernatural in my Christian life, or I'm going to have to walk by faith in verse 14, and it can be pretty tough on the flesh, but the supernatural life is lived there. It's just the way, it's just the way that it is. So they camped there where there was no water for the people to drink, and they departed from there, and they camped in the wilderness of Sinai where Moses received uh, the law from God. And then they moved from the wilderness of Sinai, and they camped at Kibroth Hatava, which you might remember is entitled, it, the name means Graves of Lust. We're sick of this manna. We don't want any more manna. We want meat. 
So you've got the insurrection going on. God says, all right, I'll give you meat. Quail come in. You have more quail. You know what to do with it. So they got the quail and they ate it. And before they could even chew it adequately between their molars, God sent a plague on them and, and uh, wiped that group out. And so it was the graves of, uh, the grave of lust. And, and so all of that recorded in Numbers chapter 11. And then he goes through a lot of names that we don't really, can't really tie biblical events to, down to verse 36. And they moved from uh, Ezion Geber and they camped in the wilderness of Zin, which is Kadesh or Kadesh. And so this is where Moses' uh, sister Miriam died. And they moved from Kadesh and uh, camped at Mount Hor on the boundary of the land of Edom. And so here they come, Numbers chapter 20. They're moving toward their staging area, coming by the land of Edom. And, and they were uh, attacked there. And then Aaron the priest went up to Mount Hor at the command of the Lord and died there in the 40th year after the children of Israel had come out of the land of Egypt on the first day of the fifth month. Aaron was 123 years old when he died at Mount Hor. And this is included in the passage because this passage allows all kinds of dating to go on. It's put in the, in the chronology for the purpose of being able to date these events and date uh, Aaron's age and thus Moses' age and a lot, of, a lot of things. Moses knew what he was doing when he put that in there. It allows a lot of things to make sense in trying to understand kind of the chronology of things. Now the king, verse 40, uh, of uh, Arad, the Canaanite who dwelt in the south, uh, in the land of Canaan, he heard of the coming of the children of Israel. And so this speaks, Numbers chapter 21, of when this Canaanite king attacked the children of Israel and, and God uh, defeated them as a result of it. Down into verse 49, and they camped by the Jordan uh, from Beth uh, Jesimoth as far as uh, Abel uh, Acacia Grove in the plains of Moab. And so this is their current uh, encampment, uh, you know, while Moses is is writing uh, all of this. Now, one of the things that's fascinating in verse 49 is he, he, label, he labels these two camps, uh, two cities, uh, Beth, Jesimoth, and Abel, Acacia Grove, and there's a, a distance of six miles between these, these two cities. And between those two cities, that's where the children of Israel were, were encamped. So remember, two to three million people camped there. This is a gigantic gigantic camping trip. So in honor, Fourth of July weekend and all the camping that's going on, we make mention of that. But you, you get an idea. I mean, where you just look six miles out, tents in all directions. I mean, amazing what the room that it took for them. No wonder why everybody in uh, Jericho is they're coming, they're coming. And they just look across and see this huge number of people that, uh, that they're not only coming numerically strong, but they've got this incredible history of, of God's power and showing himself strong on, uh, on their behalf. And, and so uh, the, uh, the listing of all of, of of this. And so the Lord spoke to Moses in the plains of Moab by the Jordan across from Jericho, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When, that's a nice word, when you have crossed the Jordan into the land of Canaan. So this is a when? Okay, it's going to happen. This is an absolute when God says when, when is when, right? I like it when God talks about when I'm going to be in heaven. That's a sure thing. It's going to happen. So he says, when you have crossed the Jordan into the land of Canaan, then you shall drive out all the inhabitants of the land from before you. So get rid of all the evil people that are there. And uh, you shall destroy all their engraved stones, destroy all their molded images, and demolish all of their high places. And so... Uh, Moses is, is given the instruction that what he's supposed to do with the people and then what he is supposed to do uh, with uh, all of the articles of worship that they used in the worship of all of their false gods. And so it's a warning. Get rid of the evil people that are in the land and then don't even don't even leave a hint of the junk that they worship. Because if you think there isn't something attractive to the flesh about what they worship, then you'll find out there is. And the only safety is to destroy it so there is nothing that you could piece back together to figure it out later. 
And, and so that's, that's the level of, of the destruction that, that he, he calls for, not to allow any of it to survive. The land was to be a clean land. It was to be a pure land. And so the word, of course, for us related to this, God calls us as Christians to make sure that we're careful about our personal relationships, careful that we are not willingly associating and coming under the influence of evil people or coming under the influence of or allowing evil things into our lives. He's going to talk about how it's going to have the potential of tripping them up in, in just a moment. Get rid of all that junk. Get rid of quit hanging around with those kinds of people. It's going to be nothing but trouble for you. Now, their possession of the land. So they're going to go in. They're going to conquer the promised land and they are going to dispossess a people to do that. Now, that's not really politically correct today uh, in, in a lot of people's minds. So, so how could God take and push one group of people out and then, another, and then bring another group in? He's been speaking since the time of Abraham for over 400 years that he's going to give this land to the children of Israel, but he is not going to give it to them until the iniquity and the sin of the people in the land becomes so great that he is forced by necessity of his own holiness and righteousness to force them out. This isn't just God, you know, looking at a map and let's see, where will I put them? Boom. These people needed for the good of mankind to be displaced from this great place of influence in the world. The, the land of Israel is smaller than New Jersey. It's smaller than uh, many of the counties in California, just a little tiny thing. But you've got three continents of the world that tie to that one piece of land. It is very, very influential real estate. A lot of traffic rolled north, south, east, and west through Israel. And he wanted that piece of land to be a place that would be an influence for godliness. So God says, I don't want you going there and dispossessing these people under your own authority. I want you to go in and do it because I am telling you to do that. And, and so, so he, he, he does it. Listen, this is God's world. And he can do whatever he wants with it. Anything he chooses to do with any piece of the land, he can put whoever he wants in it, have it be for whatever it's his purposes. Man is only renting here. At best, long-term lease. We're only renting here. So, what if you had, if the renters are trashing the place and they're doing all kinds of wickedness and, and, and ungodly, vile things that violate the, the, the righteous convictions of the owner? Well, we give a, a, a renter, a, a landlord, the, the privilege of being able to get that kind of tenant out of there. And that's what God is doing with the Canaanites. He's saying, this is my land. They're trashing the place. They're doing stuff that's an abomination in my eyes. I'm going to get them out of here and I'm going to move some proper tenants in. And he's free to do that. And, and that's exactly what, what he, he does. And you shall divide, verse 54. So here's how the land was to be divided among uh, the, the tribes, the nine and a half tribes that were going to uh, possess that part of the land. You shall divide the land by lot as an inheritance among your families. To the larger you shall give a larger inheritance, and to the smaller you shall give a smaller uh, inheritance. Then there, everyone's inheritance shall be whatever falls to him by lot. You shall inherit according to the tribes of your fathers. And so he, he says the larger tribes are going to get larger, larger numerically, are going to get a larger piece of land. The smaller tribes get a smaller piece of land so that each family within the tribe will have, end up with about the same amount of, of land. But if you do not drive out the inhabitants of the land before you, he says, you don't take me seriously about driving these people out and, and making mincemeat out of their uh, things that they worship. If you don't drive the inhabitants of the land out from before you, then it shall be that those whom you let remain shall be irritants in your eyes. You ever get something in your eye? Oh. Man, it's an irritant, isn't it? Thorns in your side. I don't even talk about that. 
and they will harass you in the land where you dwell. Moreover, it shall be that I will do to you as I thought to do to them. And so he said, if you don't take get these people out of there and you don't, you know, make just crush everything that, that they worship, then these people and what they worship are just going to be a constant source of trouble to you. They're going to make your life miserable spiritually. They're going to make your life miserable uh, uh, physically. And so he says, get rid of them. You think about, I mean, this allow it to search our hearts tonight. How many of us here, if there are any of us here tonight, where we are maintaining relationships in our life that God has told us should have no part in our life, or we have in our homes or in our whatever things that are forbidden by God. They're the things that the world worships, but he tells us we are not to worship those things. Now, what do those, what do those relationships and those things do in your spiritual walk? They make you miserable. They are a constant irritation. They are a constant temptation. They are a constant fight. It's a constant battle that God wants us to be freed of. So he said, get rid of them, get it out of the way, and then you don't have to be messing with any of this stuff. And I really like verse 56. He said, moreover, it shall be that I will do to you as I thought to do to them. So he says, you go into that land and you get wicked like them. And you start worshiping what they're doing. Don't think, don't think that I will treat you differently simply because you're my people. Because right is right and wrong is wrong and I'm a righteous God and I'm a holy God. And if you do what they're doing and then you say, well, God doesn't mind because I'm a Christian. He says, you'll find out real quick, I do mind and you'll find yourself out of the land. And... and and messed up. And so we're not any different because we're saved in terms of what evil associations and sin wants to do in our life. I'm a Christian, and so evil associations, they don't affect me. It doesn't work that way. I'm a Christian, and so the wickedness of the world has no effect on me. Well, that's laughable, isn't it? Uh, it'll do, it will do to us in terms of making our life miserable and then forcing even the discipline and chastening of God upon us as, as much as it would for anyone else. And so there's just he's bringing a real sobriety there related to that, because sometimes people can think, well, you know, I'm different. I'm a Christian. I can do this and God will just forgive me and it won't be any kind of big deal. Well, you can find, for sure one thing that's going to happen is you, you, he'll drive, will be driven out of the promised land by those things. In other words, a person that's engaged in those kind of relationships and that kind of sin is no longer possessing the promises of God and growing in their relationship with the Lord. So it costs us something that's even more valuable than it would have cost them in land because what is given to us spiritually is not just blood bought, it is the blood of Jesus Christ bought. And so the importance, as he, as he speaks here, and says, don't think that you're some odd egg here and that, that it, it, it'll have a different end for you. Stay away from all this junk. So we'll stop there uh, tonight and we'll look, Lord willing, uh, to, if we're all around, to finish these last three chapters um, next week. I'm, I'm be seated. Numbers chapter 34 this evening. Sunday night's. Genesis to Revelation. Now remember the children of Israel are camped on the eastern side of the Jordan River and they're just about ready, uh, really just uh, slightly over a month away or so from entering into the promised land. And uh, the group that Moses is dealing with at this particular uh, point in time, you'll hear me repeat this many times throughout the, the book of Deuteronomy, but he's not talking to the first generation of, of the children of Israel that came out of uh, Egypt. They have now died off. And so what he's speaking to a, a group of people now that are the second generation, and uh, in some ways he's repeating certain things, giving them new information 
uh, because uh, they uh, they were just whippersnappers when they uh, the oldest of them uh, heard these things the first time or were exposed to them. And uh, so he's uh, he's refreshing their memory. And for those that haven't heard, uh, they're hearing it for the first time. And in chapter 34, it's an interesting chapter for those of you who read a, a little bit ahead of time. Uh, this afternoon or whenever you look at it and say, wow, OK, why even bother reading through that in, in the chapter? Because th- it's the Bible. OK, that's the short answer. All right. But we never do the short answer around here. So here's the longer answer. that's uh, on top of that. It, in chapter 34, uh, God gives the children of Israel the boundaries of the land that they're going in to possess now uh, it, it, the, the promised land. So he gives them the northern boundary, the southern boundary, the eastern boundary, and uh, the western boundary. And he's just giving them a little, it's a little sliver of land. It's not a big piece of land. Hard to believe. You go to Israel and you can drive it up and down. It takes less time than to drive down to L.A. It's it's smaller than our state of New Jersey. But you don't have to have a, a lot of land when it's well located. And the nation of Israel is very well located. It connects three of the great continents of the world together. And the traffic of the ancient world, the center of the ancient world was not the United States of America. The center of the ancient world was Asia, Africa, and Europe. And they connected those three continents together. Virtually everything that happened went through their land. So if you're going to give a group of people, your people, a small piece of land in order for them to be an influence for you in the whole world, and you know they're going to probably be a relatively small group of people in terms of the population of the whole world, you couldn't give them a better piece of land. Not just is it a prosperous piece of land and flowing with milk and honey and, and able to, to raise great herds and, and, and crops and all these things, but its location is very, very strategic. And the strategicness of the location is uh, even, you know, well known to us today. It's the whole eyes of the whole world are on, on Israel. And uh, who's going to threaten Israel? Is Israel going to stop Iran before uh, Adminijab makes his threat that he's going to launch missiles and wipe them out and his uh, version of the holy war and all? So it's, it, all that stuff's even going on today. But one of the things that uh, the Lord was doing in giving them kind of these set God-determined borders is God knew he was going to bless them. They're going to go in that land. He wasn't kidding when he said, it's a land flowing with milk and honey. You're going to prosper there. You're not just going to get by, you know, from week to week and, and wonder what's going to happen. This, this land will give you, uh, it'll give you crops and it'll allow you to raise herds. It'll be more than you can eat as a people. You're going to prosper there. And one of the, and one of the hardest things for God's people, any people, but God's people, uh, to handle is prosperity. Because we, we can have a tendency to get a little more time on our hands and, and some options that, that we might not otherwise have. And then we can start to get ourselves into trouble. And so he's telling them, you're going to prosper there. You're going to become wealthy there. And then what does uh, the history of man teach us? That when nations prosper materially, they start to look to their neighbors. Well, what do they got over there that we can have? And, and so they become strong, they become powerful, they develop a military, they develop an expansionist mentality, and pretty soon they're taking over all the countries around them. And God does not want, did not want in his, God's, in his people then, not in his people now, to have this expansionist mentality and, and, and kind of military mentality related to the rest of the world, that they exist for us to conquer and not for us to get everything that we can from them. And so he says, these are your boundaries. And so I'm going to give you these boundaries. You'll have enough on your hands to go ahead and possess all of that land. And I don't want you to go any further than that. And you look at the nation of Israel even today. How many of those nations that surround them could they whoop? You pick up Modesto B tomorrow morning and they've invaded. You name the nations they could invade strip them of all of their wealth, expand their territory, time 10 in 48 hours. They could do it. They have the power to do it militarily there. And yet, to Israel's credit to this day, they're not an expansionist people. They just want their piece of land, the land that God has given them within those borders, and they'll be happy with that. Now, David had to fight against the nations that were around him because they attacked him to take from the children of Israel what God had given them. 
and the nation of Israel has to fight in order to protect what has been given to them by God even to this day. But, but again, to Israel's credit, they are following what God has said in his word. This is your land. There'll be enough in that land for you. So we pick it up there. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Command the children of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land of Canaan, this is the land that shall fall to you as an inheritance. The land of Canaan uh, to its boundaries. First three words of verse three, your southern border. So he defines now their southern border shall be along the wilderness of Zin, along the border of Edom. And then your southern border shall extend eastward to the end of the salt sea. Speaking of the Dead Sea, your border shall turn from the southern side of the ascent of uh, Akrabim, uh, continue to Zin and be on the south of Kadesh Barnea. Then you, it shall go on to Hazar Adar and continue to Asmon. The border shall turn from Asmon to the brook of Egypt and it shall be uh, shall end at the sea. Speaking of the Mediterranean Sea. Now, the description here on this, there'll be no test, but the description that he, he gives here um, is basically defines what Israel's border is to this day, their southern border. It's, it's, it's a little different than what they possess today, um, but the description that's given here for their southern border would also include the Gaza Strip. That would not be in anybody else's hands. That's a part of, a, of, of the portion of, of the Promised Land that was given to the Jews. As for the western border, verse um, uh, 6, you shall have the great sea for a border. This shall be your western border. Well, that's an easy border, isn't it? It's called the Mediterranean Sea. So that defines that border. How much to fight over there? And this shall be your northern border from the great sea. You shall mark out the great sea being the Mediterranean. You shall mount, mark out your border line to Mount Hor. From Mount Hor, you shall mark out your border to the entrance of Hamath. And then the, en- the direction of the border shall be toward Zedad, and the border shall proceed to Ziphron, and it shall end at Hazar, Enon. This shall be your northern border. And what is being described here is uh, pretty close to what their current border is, except that the border that's described here in Numbers chapter 34 would include uh, what uh, the southern section of what is known today as Lebanon. So do you see it read in the news a lot of the uh, kind of uh, uh, you know, diplomacy that's going on and sometimes something less cordial than diplomacy going on over trying to force Israel to give uh, back to Syria the Golan Heights, which is up in the north. Well, what's described here includes the Golan Heights and even more includes much of southern uh, Lebanon. And then their eastern border, you shall mark out verse 10, your eastern border from Hazar Enon to Shephem, the border shall go down from Shephem to Ribla on the east side of Ain. The border shall go down and reach to the uh, eastern side of the Sea of Chinnereth, which is the Sea of Galilee. The border shall go down along the Jordan, the Jordan River, which separates Israel from Jordan uh, today. So the border go right along that Jordan River, and it shall end at the Salt Sea, that is the Dead Sea, and this shall be your land with its surrounding uh, Boundaries, And so their uh, eastern border is very much what uh, given to them is very much what constitutes their eastern border uh, today. And so what is what is called uh, by some of the surrounding countries called the uh, occupied territory. They don't acknowledge that land that that Israel gained in uh, uh, in the previous wars uh, when they were attacked. And uh, but when you come back to the Bible, that land, everything to the west of the Jordan River is is given to uh, God. And um, he ends up having the final say on just about everything. So uh, don't bet um, your lunch money uh, against uh, Israel possessing that land. And so that was to be their eastern uh, border. And then he said, then the Lord commanded the children of Israel, saying, this is the land which you shall inherit by lot, which the Lord has commanded to give to the nine and a half tribes, uh, nine tribes and the half tribe for the tribe of the children of Reuben. 
according to the house of their fathers, the tribe of the children of Gad, according to the house of their fathers, have received their inheritance, and the half-tribe of Manasseh has received its inheritance. The two tribes and the half-tribe shall have received their inheritance on this side, that is the eastern side of the Jordan where they were camped, across from Jericho eastward toward the sunrise. So God was saying, all right, these two and a half tribes that we talked about last week, uh, they wanted the land on the east side, so they've given it. That's what they wanted in terms of their allotment in the land. So this land, the land of Canaan, it's to be divided between the remaining nine and a half tribes. And then the Lord spoke to Moses and identifying the men who were to be responsible for um, the allocation of the promised land to the different tribes and to the different clans within those tribes once they did possess uh, the promised land. And so this was their responsibility. It's one thing for God to say something. Now there need to be leaders that will then enact that. And so he takes care of all the details. These are the names of the men who shall divide the land among you as an inheritance. Uh, Eleazar the priest, Joshua the son of Nun, and you shall take one leader of every tribe to divide Divide the land for the inheritance. And these are the names of the men from the tribe of Judah. Uh, Caleb was the man that was chosen from the tribe of the children of Simeon. Uh, uh, Shemuel from the tribe of Benjamin. Eladad uh, uh, from the tribe, uh, let's see, from the tribe of Benjamin. And then a leader from the tribe of the children of Dan, Buki. Don't ever complain about your name. Your little bookie, you. What do you do? Come here, bookie. Let me get your cheek there, bookie. Your little bookie. Okay, well, okay, verse 23. From the sons of Joseph, a leader from the tribe of the children of Manasseh, uh, Haniel, and then a leader from the tribe of the children of Ephraim, uh, Kemuel, a leader from the tribe of the children of Zebulun, uh, Elizaphan, a leader from the tribe of the children of Issachar, uh, Paltiel, and then a leader from the tribe of the children of Asher, Ahihud, and a leader from the tribe of the children of Naphtali, uh, Pedahel. And these are the ones the Lord commanded to divide the inheritance among the children of Israel in the land of Canaan. So they had the responsibility to make sure that God's commands were uh, 